Welcome everybody, and thank you for joining the latest in our Ideas That Transform series. I'm Matt Fortier, Director of Student Engagement at the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown University. At the Beck Center, students are a part of everything we do because we know they're the next generation of leaders. That's why we're excited to focus our conversation today on innovative approaches in education. We'll have the opportunity to hear from people both within and outside the institution of higher education, as well as from a student herself about the transformative impact of experience-based learning. COVID-19 has put into stark relief the importance of adaptation and innovation in the educational system as students have been forced outside of the classroom. Today, as schools and educators make adjustments, we're going to discuss the value of going beyond textbooks and lectures. We'll take a look at how bridge years and other experiential, experiential education models help prepare students not only in their professional lives, but to have a positive impact in society as well. So whether you're an educator seeking to better understand how to build stronger communities and resilient leaders ready to take on and tackle the complex challenges of our time, or a student looking to gain agency in your education and to better understand how you can navigate your social impact journey with intentionality, we welcome you to the conversation today and look forward to your comments and questions. We're so pleased to have Abby Fallick, founder and CEO of Global Citizen Year, Randy Bass, Vice President for Georgetown University's Strategic Education Initiatives, Director of the Red House and Baker Trust for Transformational Learning, and Jamie Cohen, a current senior and student at George Washington University. With that, let's please turn our attention to our esteemed panelists, beginning with Abby. Abby, welcome. You founded Global Citizen Year a decade ago and have since developed over 1,000 emerging leaders from over 46 states and 30 countries through gap year programs, which you've helped rebrand as bridge years. Help us better understand what a bridge year is and how it can be transformational. Thank you so much for having me. I feel like this conversation is so timely right now. I think the world is sitting in the midst of a massive transformation. Uh, one chapter has closed and the next has yet to begin. And there's a, a, um, a power in that liminal space between those two periods of time where everything can be re-envisioned and reinvented. And there are a lot of parallels I see between the transformation and transition that we're all sitting in as a global community and the opportunity to build deliberate transitions into the, the trajectory and pipeline of the developmental process for young people. So one of the things that I deeply hope comes out the other side of, of our, our COVID disruption is a new understanding of the opportunity to provide young people with a meaningful uh, and more deliberate transition between childhood and young adulthood in particular. And, and this passion runs deep for me. I finished high school and had done all the things and checked all the boxes and gotten into Stanford and desperately wanted to take a break to step back and assess who I was and who I wanted to become in the world before just filing along like an excellent sheep into more school because it was expected of me. And my identity had been as a student and my sense of purpose had been getting to college. And even then it struck me that there was an opportunity in that sweet developmental moment of transition to give young people from all backgrounds the, the experience of figuring out who they are when they're out of their comfort zone. What does it mean to be a, a human in the world and how can you use your higher education to further your interests and goals? So that has been my, my life's work and it's, it's the mission we're on at Global Citizen Year to reinvent the pathway into young adulthood so that exceptional young people and young leaders in particular have opportunities to learn themselves in the world before embarking on their higher education. Abby, thanks so much, and we look forward to a further conversation with you. Uh, Jamie, I want to bring you in. As you experienced a bridge year firsthand, you undertook a fellowship in Ecuador through Global Citizen Year. Can you tell us what inspires you to take the less traditional route and what it did for you? Hi. Um, so excited to be here. I um, sort of background. I'm a senior right now, so I did my bridge year three and a half years ago. Um, I'm a senior at George Washington University. I'm studying organizational science and economics. And I was a Global Citizen Year Fellow in 2016. So during my Global Citizen Year, I lived with a local host family for an entire academic year in a rural community in the north of Ecuador. While in Ecuador, I learned to speak 
both Spanish and Quechua, my host community's native language, completely through immersion. I also apprenticed at a fair trade jewelry company that focused on elevating indigenous women in the community through access to jobs and childcare. While at my apprenticeship, I was able to learn really hands-on about business, especially through a social impact lens. And I was able to observe the economic impact of inclusive business practices. Um, when I'm reflecting back on about five years ago now, when I was a senior in high school and considering what my, my next steps were, I felt deeply inspired to forge my own path. Similar, I think, to Abby's um, experience as a high school senior. And I was lucky enough to have a few separate experiences throughout high school that enabled me access to experiential education. And I realized that's where I thrive. Um, test taking, classroom learning, while it certainly has its place, was just not where I felt the most engaged. Um, I recognized that I learned way more through hands-on experiences when I actually had the opportunity to learn while doing. And when I found Global Citizen Year, everything just kind of clicked into place for me. And I realized, wow, I don't actually have to be a part of this high school to college pipeline. I can take hold of my education and shape it to what what my interests are. And I learned um, during that time really invaluable skills um, that I don't really think can be developed in a classroom. I learned grit, how to do things that were hard. Living in a host community and not speaking English for weeks on end was hard. Um, I learned adaptability. Working for an NGO in a developing country as an 18 year old comes with a lot of change and I had to be adaptable to that. And I learned cross-cultural communication, not only within my host community, but within my cohort of other fellows. My peers in Global Citizen Year came from dozens of different countries and walks of life, even in the United States, and many of them helped to shape my view of the world. And then when it came time to actually return to the classroom, I had a much clearer picture of who I was and what I wanted out of higher education. And I arrived to the George Washington University knowing what I wanted. And for me, that was just opportunities to further my hands-on learning, um, which is absolutely something I've done throughout my undergraduate experience. Jamie, thank you so much for, for sharing your personal experience. And I heard Abby say earlier, you know, the importance of stepping outside of your comfort zone. And from your story, it sounds like you did exactly that and you gained so much from it. Um, so now I wanna turn to Randy, as we've heard how this can work from outside of the university system. Uh, Randy, I'd love for you to talk about how Georgetown is leveraging um, innovative learning models to fulfill its commitment, rooted in its Jesuit tradition, to the formation of informed and compassionate citizens. Great, thank you, Matt. And it's wonderful to be part of this panel. It's wonderful to be here with Abby and Jamie. I've long admired Abby's work with Global Citizen Year, and I so admire uh, Jamie making the choices that she made and the way that she's talked about them. So. It's a real pleasure to be part of this conversation. Um, I, I want to start with a phrase that Abby used, which was, you know, helping uh, students figure out how to be human in the world. And it feels to me like that that's really the anchor point of this conversation. Um, Georgetown does not have a formal bridge program uh, yet. Maybe we will someday. We've been certainly a number of us have been talking about it for a while. But I think that we deeply value the kinds of things that Abby and Jamie have been talking about, that how do you help cultivate a sense of reflection, discernment? Um, how do you help students you know, get out of their comfort zone, but open their minds, open their hearts, engage in the integrative work of connecting knowledge to, to actual engagement in the world? And that, that's really the most important thing. And it really comes down to, I think, what is the university's role in helping to shape uh, graduates who can help heal the world? Um, so there's a lot, I think there's at least two different huge spheres in which that's going on at Georgetown. There's been a lot of innovative work over the last few years in the context of how more traditional courses can incorporate this kind of engagement with the world. A whole uh, number of courses that take on complex problems, engage in global experiences, field work, community-based work, working with authentic clients. Um, trying to incorporate more of that into the formal curriculum so that it doesn't feel so separate. And then, of course, there's a burgeoning of programs 
that are completely off-site. Um, the kinds of things that you would get in a bridge year, summer global immersions, different kinds of justice immersions, alternative break programs that are also flourishing. Um, one of those programs is something that we started a year ago in downtown Washington, D.C. called the Capital Applied Learning Labs, or we call it the CALL for short. And it's where students move off the hilltop, study abroad like for a semester, move downtown, completely immersed, have an internship, take as almost all of their credits and associated with the internship, um, engage with the city, take leadership workshops, seminars, et cetera. It's meant to be an entire semester long experience in which you've stepped outside the bubble of the hilltop and, and really met the world. And I think it's doing, trying to do many of the things that I, I think a bridge year also does for students just at a different time of their journey. And let me just say one last thing and then I'll stop. I feel like the bottom line here is really about um, how do we meet the moment, this moment that we've now come to understand is one that's deeply characterized by a sense of trauma for large numbers of people in our world, deep polarization, uh, a growing gulf in people being able to talk to each other who don't see eye to eye. And I think the looming question in terms of big ideas is what is the role of higher education in helping to develop the next generation to be part of a world that feels increasingly disintegrative rather than integrative and I, I feel like that's really the heart of what we're talking about here today randy thank you so much and i know the the beck center has really enjoyed partnering with you in the many hats that you have worn um, over the last five years at Georgetown University, um, integrating experiential learning into the curriculum. I'd like to turn our attention now to challenges in, um, in approaching these innovative models for education. And I'd like to begin with the student perspective. Jamie, you faced challenges as you transitioned from your bridge year to your first year at George Washington University. Can you please share a bit more about those challenges you faced? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when I, when I think about the challenges of a bridge year, there is certainly a host of challenges with um, departing a bridge year and then jumping onto a college campus. But I think that when thinking about challenges, it's really twofold. So there's the challenge of the decision to take a bridge year when you are a high school junior or senior and you're prepping for your college um, application. You know, how do you make that decision? And then there is, of course, the challenge of post-bridge year arriving to college. Um, so just to dig a little deeper on the first, the first challenge to actually take a bridge year and to touch on my experience a little bit more, um, I think one of the largest challenges is accessibility. It's a huge piece of that. Not everyone has the ability to turn down higher education for an unproven, uncredited, unaccredited program or project. Um, Global Citizen Year offers an incredibly generous scholarship program that enabled me to take advantage of a bridge year, but that's one organization and that is certainly not institutionalized into the bridge year world by any means. Um, for me, that, that decision to actually take the leap was very much what I touched on earlier about knowing myself and knowing, you know, where I best learn and that's through hands on projects. Um, and then kind of challenging, you know, what what that next step looks like post high school. I don't have to follow um, my peers. And then when focusing in a little bit more and, and thinking about what the other end of that looked like, um, it was very challenging to get back into a classroom setting. Um, you know, I think about sitting in a classroom, a Spanish classroom, learning out of a textbook when I had just spent nine months before textbook free talking to you know my host mother and my younger host siblings and actually learning through immersion and that was challenging to adapt back to that kind of rigid test taking um educational experience and then also um you know looking at my peers it was challenging to connect with students who had just graduated high school and didn't necessarily have a clear understanding of what their purpose was um, at college. It was, I noticed a lot of my peers had a lot more social growth 
that they had not developed yet and that I had spent, you know, a year developing. And I think I still notice a lot of the things that I learned during my bridge year um, that I had, don't think I would have had the opportunity to learn um, just through the traditional college experience. And I think just to circle back to what I mentioned before, again, grit, um, you know, cross-cultural communication. Those are things that I think my peers who didn't take bridge years um, and didn't have, you know, intentional educational experience are still behind in. Thank you, Jamie. And I'd actually like to ask a, a follow-up to that. Um, you know, and I'm, to put you on a, the spot a little bit, if you were to reimagine your first year at George Washington University, um, where there might be a formal partnership to integrate your bridge year experience with your undergraduate experience, what might have been one or two things that GW could have done to help you integrate and, and find your people? Um, I think connecting peers of fellow um, bridge year participants. So I definitely did my own hunting for other bridge year students. Um, and I found that community, but that was through my through my own searching of um, the campus. So if they had been a little more intentional with that. Um, and I also think if the university had valued my experience, maybe at the level of offering credits for um, some of the experiences that I had, um, that would have been incredibly beneficial for me. Thank you, Jamie. So Randy, we just heard the benefits of bridge years and we've heard some of the challenges directly from Jamie, a student, on the, the lack of integration between her, her um, bridge year experience and her undergraduate experience. So help us understand why it's so hard to institutionalize these experience and what has been the impact of COVID-19? Well, I was gonna say, I'm sold, let's do it. Um, a great, uh, great description of your experience and I and I'm glad you went Jamie to what it felt like when you finally got to a traditional university classroom because that was one of my questions too. Um, so I think that in the past the difficulty with starting with trying to imagine what uh, a, a formal bridge your experience would look like and the way that we had been talking about it at Georgetown was always in the context of could we imagine a bridge your experience that had credits Georgetown credits associated with it. Abby can probably elaborate on this when, when she talks. Um, in part, uh, for a variety of reasons, um, equity being one of them, you know, and to make this much more equitable experience, but also uh, what you, you know, so beautifully talked about, Jamie, which is kind of maturation and personal development. Um, there's already students who choose this maybe a little bit further ahead on the maturation curve, then they take a bridge year, and if they come with no credits and they start as first year students, they're they're really one to two years now behind their reference point of where they are in terms of their own development. So if you could get people to do a bridge year and get something close to a year of credit, um, or at least tipping toward a year of credit to be able to start as something like a sophomore, at least you'd be, in terms of your own personal development, closer to your reference point of a peer group. So that was always what we thought. And I think traditionally the difficulty had been that universities like Georgetown are very invested in a very particular model. You're either here or you're not. You're either in traditional classes or you're not. You're either immersed in this community or you're not, right? You're either around people who are becoming your mentors or you're somewhere else. That has in many ways been the difficulty. How do you control the credits? How do you validate that? How do you justify being here and not here? And I think that was really very much where we kind of stalled on the kinds of planning. In many ways, the COVID adaptation has changed all that. We've, what we might say, we've jumped the binary. <laughs> we now have had to adapt to where you can be here and not here. You can be in a community and virtual. Uh, you can be in classes that are, that are deeply engaging with knowledge and be virtual. So it's not that we should always be virtual, but I think that we've, we've now, as an entire community, experienced that some other remix of presence and elsewhere, virtuality and on the ground experience, that some new remix of that is possible in a post COVID world. So, so perhaps all the kinds of um, things that we had been thinking about before are newly imaginable in this very, very new space. Excellent, thank you, Randy. And, and so glad to hear that, um, that you've been sold. 
<laughs> we look forward to institutionalizing these partnerships. So Abby, you have deep experience in forming these types of institutional partnerships. Can you help us understand what these partnerships look like? And from your perspective, from where you sit, what has been the impact of COVID-19? Yeah, it's a great question. It's been really um, helpful to hear both Jamie and Randy speak to some of the challenges. Um, and, and I'll actually start there because I would say our work partnering with institutions has been defined as much by the challenges as the opportunities in many senses. Uh, so I, I think we would start by saying that there's a challenge around the perception of this year. And, and it starts with the terminology we use. So you'll see in this conversation, we've been talking about a bridge year. But to the extent that we have, have focused on this period of time being called a gap year, we have embedded a notion that this year is the absence of learning. If you think about what the metaphor of a gap implies, it suggests you're falling into a hole. Uh, and, and you may or may not come out of it. I think we have um, a perception that this year is available for students from wealthy backgrounds, that it is a kind of optional next step um, that is not viewed because of the language we've used and, and historically what this with this gap year has been, it's not viewed as an integral or foundational part of the learning journey. And you know, one of the other challenges is that to the extent that this is seen as separate and apart, and that practically speaking, it adds time and cost to the college experience, which is the last thing we want to be proposing at a time when it's too long and too expensive already. Uh, it, it perpetuates the sense that it is a luxury and an add-on as opposed to a foundational and, and integrated um, kind of normal entry point into beginning somebody's higher education. So all of the, the challenges that Randy spoke to are things that we've encountered in trying to broker relationships with colleges. Um, you know, there's a, a sense that higher education wants to do it themselves. There's a real reluctance to outsource anything, even if it has to be, even if it happens to be a, a type of learning um, that is not core to the university's expertise or functioning. The, the bureaucracy around accreditation and financial aid, it's been very challenging to navigate. And one of the things we've learned quickly is that each school has its own process, its own decision makers, its own policies, and its own challenges. We have managed at Global Citizen Year over the last decade of operation to form about half a dozen partnerships with colleges and universities. Um, and they range from admissions offices sending out formal invitations for admitted students at Tufts University, for example, to take a Global Citizen Year before coming back to Tufts. Some of those offers include financial aid coming from the university or financial aid that gets remitted back. Um, others include the offer of, of some course credits um, when students arrive. But the big vision from my perspective has always been, and I'll, I'll emphasize this now because I think our COVID moment is making this much more viable than we would have recognized six months ago. The big vision is this becomes a normal, integrated, accessible, and standard part of a young person's transition into higher education, where this is not added time and cost. It's not a quote unquote gap. It's recognized to be a blend of experience with instruction in, in the right proportions that helps young people transition more effectively into what comes next. And that there are resources available to that. And it becomes um, you know, expected that before you set foot on a college campus, you've done something real in the world and you're able to articulate the questions that are going to be driving your higher education. We like to say that there, there may be a higher education than your higher education. And I think COVID is really shining a, a light on the fact that we can't let schooling in its traditional and formal sense interfere with what we mean by an enriching holistic education for our young people. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Abby. And I, I heard Randy in his last response also bring up the question of equity. And Abby, you, you spent a little bit more time on it. So I want to go back to Randy. Um, if you want to speak to the question of equity and how Georgetown is thinking about access to these different experiential learning opportunities. I think it really, yeah, it does build on exactly what Abby's saying. If we're thinking about what is next for higher education, how are we moving toward greater customization of pathways? Um, how might we even think about certain ways that students might accelerate uh, three-year bachelor's degrees, integrated bachelor master's degrees? Uh, there's a lot of things that I think will start to emerge over the next few years as a result of 2020. I, if, if we're not thinking continuously 
how are we innovating with equity in mind, then those innovations will by themselves naturally just drive more inequity. They will be inequitable unless we intentionally make them equitable, right? All these things that allow people to burnish their education, to accelerate, to customize, those all advantage the already advantaged. And so if we're not coming up with very specific plans, like what Abby was implying, something like a one plus three that really does build a bridge here into the progress to degree where all financial aid can be applied, where the credits and the progress to degree are the same as if you had matriculated traditionally. Um, we will never have a truly equitable situation in which this kind of uh, really transformative education is available to everyone in, in an equitable fashion. So, yeah. so I think it's absolutely essential to, to think about these innovations with equity in mind um, or else we're, at, we're just doing a disservice to our own values. I couldn't agree more, Randy. And I think, I mean, I'm conscious of the fact that we are four white, educated, very privileged people sitting here having this conversation. Um, and, and I feel some tension around that. I think Global Citizen Year from the outset has been, you know, we were set up as a not-for-profit so that we can focus on creating an experience that's been accessible broadly to young people. We have a need-blind admissions process. 80% of our fellows over time have received need-based financial aid, 40% are Pell Grant eligible when they get to college, more than half self-identify as people of color. And, and we've been trying to model by example what we mean by casting a wider net for talent. We don't use test scores or um, grades in our admissions process. We're looking for leadership potential and that spark that comes when we can find a young person who has created something from scratch and inspired others to follow their lead. We're recognizing that the traditional way that we have created this high stakes game to get into elite college uh, it unlevels the playing field in such dramatic ways that we need entirely new systems for thinking about how do we identify talent because it's evenly distributed even as opportunity is not and how do we give talented young people shared experiences not just with others like them but with young people from a broad set of backgrounds and integral to our curriculum at global citizen year from the outset has been a focus on equity inclusion racial justice and the opportunity for young people who've grown up in dramatically different contexts to learn not just about the global majority through their immersive experience in the fellowship, but through their cohort experience of getting to know and learning to rely on and respect and appreciate and learn from a peer who's come from such a different background. And when we look out at the ruptures in our social fabric in the US and specifically right now, so much of that can be solved for. If we catch young people on the cusp of adulthood and give them structured and supported ways of learning to work across lines of difference, to be empathetic to others' experiences and to embed an equity lens in how they're gonna show up, not just in the college classroom, but as they move into leadership positions across all sectors. Thank you, Abby. And um, you, you, you brought up a point about admissions and the power of shared experiences. And I'm well aware that um, high school students have a lot of pressure on them to have these experiences on their resume as part of the um, college admissions process. So I'm curious to either Jamie, Randy, or both, from your perspective, would having this type of shared experience, this bridge year program as you transition from high school to college, would this take some of the pressure off of students, of high school students, and having these experiences already on their resume? You, you mean if, uh, if, if these were a much more common kind of thing, would it take that pressure off? Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that, and that was the point that I was trying to make earlier, which is that um, right now they tend to be, tend to, to, to be experiences that are just burnishing people's records out of high school that are often a many year journey of, of layering achievements of all kinds, one on top of the next, that feels like a kind of arms race toward a selective school, that a, a very long protracted process of university admission in which people are trying to get as high to the top as possible. And so it'd be very, it'd be great if we could think of these kinds of experiences um, not in as being just at the top of that pyramid of that long journey to selective admissions, 
but that it was a very widely available, rich experience, um, just like we think of working in a lab or getting an internship, that these are just the kinds of things that everyone should have access to and that are very important in what we think of as, as what we mean by education. They're, they're, they're actually now uh, inseparable from what we mean by education, but they're not evenly distributed in people's access to them, especially very early in their trajectory. Thank you, Randy. And seeing all the questions coming in, I want to turn us to our last round before we do open it up for questions. As a reminder to our attendees, please submit your questions um, via the Q&A option on your Zoom chat, um, and we'll get to your questions very shortly. So I want to end with a call to action, as these are all great ideas, and we've seen more and more that students are looking for this kind of option. So what's one thing you want everyone here to do that will help this be an option in every college curriculum? Jamie, I'd like to start with you. I love this question. Um, just, I think, thinking about action and, and what we as students can do and just taking the student perspective. Um, so whether you're a student who's in their junior or senior year of high school and kind of questioning what's next, or you are a college student like myself who is feeling a little lost in Zoom classrooms, I think what's really important for students to know is that we can challenge the value of institutional education. So we can be the directors of our own education. If you feel that traditional institutional education is just not cutting it, there are incredible ways to supplement that with innovative hands-on learning. So whether it be Global Citizen Year Academy, the Beck Center, which has been very impactful in my own personal undergraduate educational experience or something else. There are alternatives within universities and outside of universities that allow students to take agency and shape their own education. Love it, Jamie. Thank you. Um, Randy, I'd like to turn back to you now. So first, I think it'd be very interesting to make sure that we're hearing the stories of all the students, all the students, who did take leaves this year, who didn't return to campuses. And they'll be quite different. They're not all having the kinds of bridge year experiences we're talking about by any stretch. But I think there's probably something very powerful to be learned um, from the students who, who did sit out this year. Uh, and, and I don't think we should overlook that as an incredible opportunity. Um, more broadly, I think it's really just everyone starting to value more the idea that we should be as involved in, I'm going to use the word character, character development as testable knowledge. And that I think if there's anything that's been so powerful about 2020, it's that higher education needs to up its game in the way in which it helps to develop full human beings for the world, not just testable knowledge or faster credentials or that when we talk about the value proposition of higher education, it's not about right-sizing tuition to virtual learning. It's about really examining what is the role of this very special institution of higher education in developing full human beings for this moment, for this really complicated, very challenging moment in our history. So I think everybody can contribute to that wherever they are in the ecosystem in terms of expecting that as what it means to be part of higher education. Love it, Randy. And I, I love the, um, the challenge you've put out that higher education needs to up its game. And I couldn't agree more. Abby, we'll conclude with you. A, a call to action from your perspective. I, I think it circles back to where I opened, which was about this moment that we're sitting in. Um, we don't know when COVID ends or what things look like coming out the other end. But what I would say is don't miss this moment. Don't miss this opportunity to question every assumption we've had. So if you're a student, why would you go straight to college without pause to reflect on who you are and why you're going? If you're a parent, don't let your kids schooling interfere with their education. Encourage them to take time out of the classroom to do things that are enriching of their character, as Randy said, that help stretch them and help learn things that they can't learn in a classroom or a lecture hall. If you are a donor, think in new ways about what counts as success. What are we measuring? Is it just the college degree and credential? Or is it actually a set of abilities that are redefined for what the world needs now? 
I would implore us all to step back and just reconsider what do today's young people most need to learn and how do we reinvent the systems and the pathways around that? So my call to action is don't miss this moment. Question the status quo and do what you can to disrupt it from wherever you're sitting. Fantastic, Abby. Thank you. So I see the questions pouring in and I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Francesca Rebar, who's been monitoring questions and will help us do a lightning round of Q&A. Thank you, Matt. Um, we have some great questions and I'm going through them. Um, I think a common theme in the questions has been back to the topic of credits. Um, and really integrating um, the potential bridge years into um, institutions. So um, one participant mentioned that, you know, as the economic slowdown accelerates, students might not have access to resources, funding, family support to do these experiences and how, um, you know, most students can't even study at college anymore without working part-time jobs um, while being a student. Um, she mentions that you need to have a minimum of six credits for part-time federal financial aid, um, 12 credits for full-time aid. So do you have an example of how universities are addressing um, this issue of financial equity? And I'll turn it Rand over to Randy, maybe. <laughs> Randy, that looks like a tailor-made question for you, though, Abby, no, feel free I, to I'm, chime I'm in. Interested. Yeah, well, so I, I can certainly say the ways that we speculated about them, interested because I know Abby's had many conversations with many institutions, at least exploring this space. Um, so we, you know, grappled with all these issues and I think they're all incredibly salient and that to me is why we were trying to imagine some minimum number of credits that would span the year um, in order to worry about things like federal financial aid and full cost of attendance, et cetera. Um, so those things all have to be factored in. You know, I think we, um, had imagined that there were some courses that could be done virtually. There were some things that could be integrated with the year. A couple of schools that um, Abby had worked with that I communicated with had integrated language credit, um, experiential credit. Uh, now we know we can do things like first year seminars or first year writing courses could be done virtually very effectively and integrated with the on the ground experience. And then that doesn't even begin to get into what would be the thematic emphases of sites in which students were doing problem-based work or community engagement. So, so there was a lot of room to basically develop um, close to a year's worth of credit if the university was willing to be that flexible. Um, and then that would allow all the other engagements of financial aid and other things to kick in because then it's essentially functioning on the same business model as all the other, as all the other courses. Um, so there's, there's many intricacies I could geek out for way longer than we have on this, having thought about these details for a long time. But, um, but I, th I think they're achievable if, they, if there's will to create something that could work that would be equitable. Thank you, Randy. Um, and going off of that integration piece, um, and maybe I'll send it over to Abby for this question, but um, concerning the idea of giving credit for a bridge year, how could you maybe reconcile general education credits that freshmen routinely have to complete at the beginning of the, their academic careers um, and credits that are specific to um, an experience? So I think Randy shared a bit of this. There are some really obvious places to give and get credit around, particularly if you're traveling and learning a language, if you can do sort of self-reflection and, and personal writing as a part of something. Um, we've found integration with uh, general ed credits around um, like world survey courses and, and history and cultures. Um, but it's really school specific. So it's a little bit hard to say in general. And I think, again, this is one of the challenges that we're finding. Um, we would love for colleges to start thinking more flexibly about what happens in that first year curriculum. And it may be that you're taking some of the, the general ed courses when you come back, but you have an opportunity to tailor make this first year around experiences and curriculum that integrate that help you figure out who you are and who you're becoming. To just totally rethink 
what the front end, what the on-ramp into the rest of your education looks like, and not to get quite so hung up on, well, this is how we've always done the freshman year. It's a really a reorientation and a re-envisioning of what's the best way to prepare a young person to take advantage of their experience on campus when they arrive. Thank you. Um, Jamie, I'm going to throw this question to you. Um, we have someone in the attendance who is a Global Citizen Year and Georgetown alumni. Um, so thrilled to have her listening in on this conversation. Um, she reflected that she had um, ex experienced similar challenges that you mentioned while adjusting to um, life on the hilltop when she um, came back from doing her, her bridge year, her gap year. Um, and she's curious what um, universities can do to encourage students in taking a gap year and you know, supporting them when they're back on campus, um, also particularly for students who identify as Black, Indigenous, or people of color. Yeah, um, that's a great question. And I think it's particularly relevant now because there's not in this upcoming year or, or two years, there's not going to be just students who took bridge years returning to campus, but there's going to be a whole host of students from many different educational backgrounds and experiences that are arriving to college, um, just due to the implications of online learning and people are deciding, you know, this is I'm going to take a, a break for a semester. I'm not going to go right away. So I think in the coming months, students, this is a more, a more broad conversation for all students, not just bridge year students, that are going to be arriving to campus with very different experiences. And I see this as an opportunity for universities to learn how to welcome students back when they're not just, you know, next year um, pipeline of, of students. So I think universities need to be very intentional both with bridge year students and in the coming years with students who are who are taking pauses in their education um, formal education i think there needs to be more effort to create community between these students when thinking really specifically about what universities can do um, because there are more and more students who aren't doing that direct path and if universities accept that and recognize that that can be a value to the university mm -hmm. and figure out ways to build more community between students from different educational backgrounds intentionally, um, I think we'll see more people, more students feeling comfortable to not do that straight path because they know when they arrive to college, there will be you know, the opportunity to connect with other students who aren't from traditional educational backgrounds. Yeah, that feels like one of the unique opportunities of this moment right now, where nationally it's looking like something like 20% of students who thought they were going to enroll in their freshman year this fall have opted to do something else, um, COVID-related disruptions. And so when we anticipate when those students come back to campus, we will have a ready-made cohort, bigger been a historically um, kind of critical mass of young people who have done something else for a year. And I think colleges will be wise to meet them where they are as they come in and see them exactly as Jamie said, as an asset and a resource for the university. These are going to be, uh, you know, potentially college freshmen who are more mature, more focused, more clear on what they care about having had some real world experience. And my hope is that this becomes a, a proof point that helps us all reorient why in the world we would be admitting kids straight out of high school into college without proactively encouraging them to do something else before they arrive. Definitely. I think that, um, you know, there is like this to get to the point where this can be more of an institutionalized um, and encouraged opportunity um, there is advocacy and should be advocacy from both the students and the staff um, at universities. Um, we have someone attending who runs a leadership development program in the business school at the University of Colorado. Um, and they recruit a cohort of about 40 incoming freshmen each year to participate in a four year program. Um, and they're wondering what would be the best way to frame questions to capture a bridge year experience on their application. Um, so how can they really tailor um, 
and advertise this as a great opportunity for students. Abby, if you want to take a first. Uh, yeah, sure, that. I'm happy to. I mean, my dream around this has been uh, that, that you're actually not even in, invited to apply to college until you've done something real in the world. And I think of the parallel to, it sounds like um, the question came from somebody at a business school, but the parallel to business schools and law schools, professional schools that used to recruit students straight out of college. And now they, they don't do that anymore because they recognize that they get such better students when they've had real world experience. So that's on one far extreme, which is to say, that's the expectation. You are uh, you know, eligible to apply at the point that you can tell us about what this transitional experience has been for you. What have you done in the time that you've been out of school to reflect on the purpose of school in your own development? Um, but beyond that, I think, uh, you know, there are a number of schools that have added a, a checkbox that says, hey, I'm either considering or am committed to taking a year off before enrolling. And I think for schools to develop policies that, that are explicit, that they look favorably on that, that they may be offering a pool of financial aid for students who are considering doing that. And they just make it clear that it factors in in a positive way, not the opposite um, in, in considering uh, how to create their, their incoming class. Definitely. Um, and another person asked, um, maybe Abby can provide some statistics of how many students go on bridge years annually. Um, and then Randy, if you want to talk a little bit to the question of, you know, how many students do you think it would take um, for to be, you know, doing these bridge years and gap years where to make the general attitude start to change um, about schools being more accepting and, you know, promoting that opportunity. Yeah. So the you know the data is kind of tricky to navigate um, because students will postpone college enrollment for all kinds of reasons. But historically, in the U.S., it's been significantly less than one percent of high school graduates who defer actively defer their enrollment in college. Um, this year, it's looking like it's closer to twenty percent, which is really dramatic, and I think will make for um, some very important research over time about what is it look like for this cohort of students who've had a, a really different pathway into higher education. Um, and I guess the other thing I would say here is part of where the data is tricky is that not all quote unquote gap years or bridge years are the same. So there are a set of programs run by for-profit travel operators where wealthy kids can be with other kids like them and have very curated experiences around the world. And I don't mean to be totally dismissive of that, but it's also not really what we're here to talk about. Um, if we're focused on preparing young people with a, a social justice orientation and an experience of, of global equity and the role they're going to play as a leader in advancing justice, um, that looks very different from a lot of these experiences and opportunities are. And then we've also got plenty of young people who need to work for a year or stay home to take care of um, family situations. Um, and that is also valuable maturing experience as well. But I think there's a moment uh, societally to step back and say, well, what, what do we mean by a deliberate and transformative transition into young adulthood? What are the elements of that experience that we want to provide for every young person? And for me, it has to do with leaving your comfort zone, learning to interact effectively across lines of difference, doing something in the service of something beyond just yourself and potentially beyond your, your immediate community or your family, and having some kind of coaching and self-reflection built in. And if we could put all of those ingredients and elements in place as a wraparound to whatever else the year might look like, I think we'll have a whole new generation of humans um, who are really equipped to change the world. Thank you. And I think I would answer the question about how it could become more of a norm. I don't, I don't know that I know how to answer it in terms of numbers, because I feel like it's more about what the institution is doing to validate it and to elevate it as a, as a very normal expected kind of uh, thing that uh, you know I think uh, Jamie's response was right on target when she said that you know how you would um, help make it equitable and and connect it to colleges people have to feel like they wouldn't be behind that it's somehow not like aberrant to do this mm -hmm. and that you're somehow uh, taking a risk we know that what looks like a positive risk to advantage people looks like precarious risk to others. And so it, it can't look 
like it's somehow disengaged or allowed. It has to look like it's really validated and elevated and valued as one pathway, at least, into, uh, in, in, not even into the university, because you would be in the university. I think that's the really critical notion. This is, this is just another way of beginning your university journey, not deferring it. Just back to what Abby was saying about all the semantic um, issues with the word gap is that somehow you're not making progress. Mm -hmm. I think it has to look like just another way to make progress with all these other added benefits. Um, I think it's also these kinds of experiences are going to be part of a much larger sea change over the next decade of the ways that people will customize their experience. Some will be taking bridge years, some might be taking semesters off. We might see where residency requirements for residential schools um, are, are changing where you could spend more semesters somewhere else because you could continue your coursework virtually and be doing field work or social justice immersion work. I think in a decade, we'll find that the, the ability to customize your pathway of being inside and outside the university will have significantly shifted across the whole sector. So I think bridge years are just one very powerful um, entry point that's going to be part of this much larger pattern that we'll see unfold over the decade, in part out of the whole COVID moment. Definitely. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of great questions that we won't have time to get to. So I want to encourage you to continue the conversation on Twitter using our hashtag Beck Ideas. Um, and I'll ask one final question for Jamie. Um, a student is asking, what's your advice to a college student who feels trapped? So, you know, someone who's maybe in their second, third, even their fourth year of college and just like wants to take a break. Yeah, um, you know, this is something that I think maybe got lost a little bit in this conversation because we are really narrowly focused on bridge years. But for me, experiential education as a whole is a really important topic. So find those opportunities. Um, you know, I spent my global citizen year in Ecuador. I've spent two summers since then living and working in other countries, um, doing hands-on projects. And, you know, even within institutions, there are organizations that really value students' education. Um, I have been really fortunate to be in an organization on my campus where I work hands-on doing consulting projects for um, tech companies abroad. And that for me has really been able to redefine what education means for me because that is like the most valuable experience I've had um, within my undergraduate institution. So I think just going back to the idea of questioning, you know, the value of the higher education and then to take action on that by seeking out alternatives. Um, knowing where you thrive and finding those opportunities and taking advantage of them. And um, if you're a Georgetown student who's, who asked that question, the Beck Center is a great, great option. Great place to start. Thanks for that. Shameless plug, Jamie. Um, definitely agree I'm, on the <laughs> experiential yeah. learning piece. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a Georgetown student, but um, the Discern and Digest series, I was fortunate enough to be a participant in because, you know, I was seeking that opportunity to connect with students who um, were having these same questions. Um, and I think the Beck Center is an incredible place to, to explore those questions. Definitely, thank you. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Matt to close us out. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody. And Jamie, thanks again for, um, for sharing your experience with the Beck Center, albeit briefly. So I want to end um, with two messages. The first is to educators and the second is to students. To the educators in our audience, there is an opportunity and I hope you've heard that today. And Randy said something that I think might break Twitter. Um, we have jumped the binary that you can be here and be elsewhere is newly Im imaginable. This is an opportunity, and as Abby said, we can't afford to miss the moment. In fact, this is a make or break moment. Universities are currently unable to deliver on their value proposition, as again, students have been forced outside of the classroom. Will universities adapt, and if so, how? In adapting, I'd encourage educators to be intentional in designing these experiences, 
we can't allow them to be gaps, as Abby referenced earlier, where students simply fall into a hole. Rather, we need to, to design experiences that will be impactful and that are equitable in access to all students. At the Beck Center, we're fortunate to work alongside students every day, ensuring that their perspective is represented in our work. And students, the message to you that I wanna share is to take agency in your education. Don't be afraid to get out of, out of your comfort zone. Take the positive risk that Randy just spoke to. And as Abby said earlier, and I really love this quote too, don't let school get in the way of your education. We need you to help reimagine and co-create the future of higher education that will best serve you. I know, for example, that Randy runs a class that invites students to apply design thinking to this very question. Seek those opportunities. Be an advocate for yourself and take the time to look inward at what you want in your education and career, rather than allowing society to dictate that for you. So with that, please join me in thanking our esteemed guests and thank you to our backstage team, Natalie, Ori, Celine, and Francesca. Natalie, back to you. Thanks, Matt. And thanks to all of our panelists. I have really enjoyed listening to you all today. Uh, before we go, know that we'll be sharing the remaining questions with our panelists. So look out for a follow-up note from us with some high-level takeaways and also ways for you to engage with us further. Please feel free to continue this dialogue and conversation using the tweet hashtag Beck ideas. We'd love to hear from you, not only on this idea, but any other emerging ideas, so we can include them in future ideas that transform sessions. Additionally, uh, we hope that this dialogue sparks some new ideas and ways to collaborate in unlikely ways. We hope that you found it stimulating and engaging. Thank you so much for being here and have a great day. <laughs>